Namaste. So, as part of the writings of Sri Aurobindo, today we take up Savitri. Uh, last time also we took up volume uh, 23, CWSA 20, 33. And today we will take up CWSA 34. So, as we know, totally in Savitri we have 12 books and 49 cantos. And I have um, discussed this elsewhere. It's a very interesting number. 12 is the number of the mother. And 49 was a number very uh, special to Vedic Rishis because it's 7 times 7. But not that Shurabinda has mentally thought and planned it like that. These things happen very naturally. And uh, last time we took up part 1 which is CWSA 33 in which there are total of 24 cantos. 3 books and total 24 cantos and it basically covers the tapasya of Ashupati which is Shurabindo's own tapasya his own experiences. Naturally, it is understood that when an author writes something, it is his own experiences. Uh, when Valmiki writes the Ramayana, he, he is writing, all that he is writing is all emerging from inside him. Any poet for that matter. So, similarly, this uh, wonderful uh, poem, epic poem is Sri own experiences. But in the Yoga of Savitri, he has incorporated the mother's experiences. So somebody may say that, well, how did you know what mother was experiencing? So mother herself has clarified. One is that their identity and union was so perfect on all the planes of consciousness that whatever was going on within mother, that automatically was known to Sri In a sense, because Sri had already arrived at cosmic consciousness and beyond the transcendent, he could easily identify with anyone and get their experiences which is what we see several times in number of his letters at the same time the mother has said something very beautiful she says uh, when he would next day morning recite to me Savitri he would be basically talking about my experiences which I had the previous night so it only uh, means that they had such a perfect um, uh, inner not just harmony but identity of consciousness several places should be said that they are two for the work, but they are one in consciousness. So let's see that why they are two for the work. So Ashupati is the one which is Shurbindo. He his main work is to bring down the divine mother, her grace, her love upon earth, embodied. He could bring it down without a human body, but embodied divine love, embodied divine grace, because then only can the problem of matter be understood and redeemed. Because divine grace is there in a general way, all over creation. So it's not something new. Divine love is there all the time. But he wants the divine love to govern the world. And for that, there has to be an instrument which is strong, capable, uh, wide, supple, completely surrendered so that it can hold the divine love and manifest it in life. So that path, if you may use the word, is the divine mother, who is none else, but she has taken the avatar, here we know as the mother whom very, in a very limited way we say the mother of Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry. <laughs> but as Sri says, love in her was wider than the universe. The whole world could take refuge in a single heart. And in this story it is Savitri. So as we know it's connected now. Ashwapati aspires to the sun god to have um, something of his as his progeny. And the divine mother comes, Savitri is born. And she is born to save earth and mankind. She is not born just to prolong the lineage of Ashupati. So that's where we see that the second part of the book or book 2, CWSA 34 starts with the birth and childhood of Savitri. It's a very beautiful book, book 4, which describes all the seasons, uh, which is symbolic of the preparation of the earth before Savitri is born, comes into existence. And then we see that the, those four cantos reveal something very interesting that Savitri already brings with her the new consciousness. Now, if you take it to the mother's life, the mother already is born with the new consciousness. But as she develops, this begins to manifest. It manifests in her mind, it manifests in her art, poetry, literature, painting, everywhere it begins to manifest. Music. So this is the new consciousness she has already brought. So the early part is when it is already beginning to manifest in her life. Then a point of time comes when in the story, in this uh, book, epic uh, Savitri, we see that Ashwapati at a point of time asks her to go and find 
the the partner who is ready to work with her so uh, well now we come back to the epic here itself so savitri goes all the way and she finds satyavan so who is satyavan savitri we know is the daughter of the sun the word of the sun the power of the sun she is embodying the creator's consciousness uh, sun is the creator in our vedic literature and ashupati is as the name um, signifies ashwa is horse so ashupati uh, horse represents power so the lord of tapasya who has gathered by the power of tapasya within him the power to rise from one plane to another so that's what ashupati is he is the tapaswin of tapasvis and uh, he brings down to earth savitri who is embodiment of grace and satyavan who is satyavan satyavan is all of us who are lost in the um, ignorance basically at one point the mother was asked what does satyavan represent in the poem the mother gave a very short answer the supreme lord so then people began to wonder that uh, supreme lord so well it is the fundamental truth of all of us we are essentially divine we are not other than the divine but we have forgotten ourselves we are caught in the web of ignorance and how do we redeem how are we to be redeemed by the mystic marriage between us and the divine mother whose portion we are so this mystic marriage is beautifully brought out through the story where satyavan and savitri meet each other satyavan is all of us um, a portion of the divine but caught in the web of ignorance so we have forgotten who we are we have lost our kingdom of glory which is her father's kingdom his father's kingdom dumat sena he has become blind so we are also blind we cannot see anything beyond the tip of our nose though we are very opinionated of course i have heard people talk about supramental and what's going to come after 100 years not knowing that what's going to happen to the life tomorrow uh, doctors particularly when they pass uh, judgments i have seen a doctor you know they sometimes pass as like a death sentence similarly there are people who prophesy doomsday has been coming since long so we really must admit that our mind is blind it doesn't know what is going to come and yet there is a possibility that this mind can be changed into the original the creator's mind the supramental truth consciousness the mind that sees the truth but to do that this fallen creature who we are fallen in the sense not because of uh, sin or papa and punya but by a very nature our consciousness has fallen into the terrestrial atmosphere wearing an earthly body and therefore we are ignorant of who we are where we are what we are doing why we are doing what is our destiny we don't even know this step in front shobindo describes it beautifully in savitri that man does not know even the step in front he is still a child in nature's mighty hands in the succession of the moment lives to a changing present is his narrow right his memory stares back at a phantom past the future flees before him as he walks so this is our state of consciousness but this should not be this will not be forever this is our present state so sabitri comes to redeem and she is picking up all the satyavans so what is the beauty of satyavan though he is caught in a web of ignorance he is all the time striving to link he has done his own effort uh, but he is trying to read behind this earth the meaning the purpose of existence he is trying to find he is trying to find that golden link which can join earth with the divine reality which he senses somewhere he senses that there is a divine reality behind all these uh, creatures and world sometimes he has a partial glimpse all that is described very beautifully in savitri uh, a veda knower of the unwritten book so he is trying but he does not know how that reality connects with this one so satyavan is all those one uh, who though caught in ignorance are yet trying to uh, make this world something of a true image of the divine they are looking for that link so savitri and satyavan story is not for the escapists those who want to escape from this world because it's a uh, sorrow and suffering it's not for those who believe suffering is uh, is the rule of life and material world is the only reality satyavan is all those who despite being caught here are having an aspiration for bringing something of the divine perfection in earthly life so to them savitri comes she comes very beautiful and as she comes she chooses satyavan uh, and then she picks him up there is a marriage but satyavan is afflicted with the fate of death that's what we see in book of fate when she comes back to tell her father that she has made a choice narad 
the divine messenger he comes and he says well everything is wonderful about the uh, boy he is, she has chosen he is a jewel upon earth among earth uh, a rare kind uh, everything is wonderful about him except and that's where we see the irony of earthly life even the best things are subject to death disintegration and decay so you may have a wonderful ideal ideal of love ideal of Uh, you know leading a life which is truly beautiful and yet after a time it undergoes a degeneration and death so satyavan like all of us is afflicted with this fate so what really is death death means a bad ending if you want to put it that way it's a bad ending to a beautiful thing when a child comes comes with so much hope parents have hope child himself as he grows up has hopes and then ultimately at some point story begins to change and there is a slow degeneration of the body of the mind of things in life we all know that need not talk about it and then some people become cynic some people simply baptize with life some simply say well that's how is the nature of life some start looking for solace in some religion some begin to look for an escape door but essentially it ends badly and the divine mother that means sri aurobindo and the mother want to change this it should not have a bad ending certainly not for everybody they i mean ultimately the whole earth should change there should be no bad ending life should be beautiful our story should be beautiful but it's not a wishful thinking so when she comes to know she says no i'll take this challenge of fate and i'll marry satyavan so but this is not just a wishful thinking that well i'll pray to god and he will change because there is a reason why this has a bad ending repeatedly there is a reason why death and falsehood is there so all that narad explains that why it is there why there is this law of karma why there is this uh, pain and suffering upon earth we find that in book 6 so where is the solution for the solution first thing is that we must reclaim our highest part the lost portion of our divinity that is only possible through yoga and savitri undertakes the yoga say in the traditional story she takes a 3 days 3 nights 3 three wa- uh, three ratri vrat where she fasts she does penance she does prayers meditation and she is equipped to take the challenge of life but 3 days 3 nights we can take it as a symbolic uh, or even if it's possible well say the essence is we must take the journey of yoga if we want to change this bad ending crying complaining will not uh, help so in a sense when we look at it why there is this bad ending it's a challenge the challenge is that well oh soul you are immortal who says see i can take you away so by this repeated challenge that's how the ishop nishad says that avidya amrityum tirtva vidya amritam asnute that repeatedly going through the challenge of death the soul in us grows like a baby who is sleeping or is in the womb yet it grows and a day comes when it is strong and ready and say okay fine i am ready let death come i know that whether i live or die i am so first thing is she must also recover her deepest psychic being the central being uh, we too must first discover who we are and then that discovery is not enough to take the challenge of death that discovery individually makes us realize our immortality but it's not enough so she goes further she becomes one with the cosmic consciousness so vast that almost she can flank death on all sides death governs all these triple worlds so she becomes an equal triple worlds she to becomes uh, filled with the cosmic consciousness the entire domain of death she encompasses within her consciousness and the third she goes beyond the cosmic consciousness into the transcendent where death cannot reach it cannot touch so then she is equipped to face the challenge of death so we see in book 8 death comes and draws the soul of satyavan and savitri follows him why is savitri following him she could have simply annihilated death because she is now so powerful but there is another story to this story it's not just a question of getting one satyavan back but of changing the law of death so to change the law of death she must change the being of death and that's what we see in the story very cryptically and beautifully described savitri is going with him and death asks her questions and then she asks questions so ultimately she tells death basically that you are yama raja the restrainer but you ought to be dharma raja one who is the guardian of dharma 
Now that is the point of time when death suddenly realizes, Yama realizes that, well, maybe what I am doing is not the right thing to do. I have taken my job a bit too seriously and I am doing it mechanically. See, what is the problem of death? It does afflicts everybody mechanically. So it says dharma is not a mechanical process. For death, all are equal in the uh, communist way. I'm sorry to say, I mean, I'm talking of the Marxist communism, <laughs> not Vedantic communism. So regardless of Takasir um, uh, Sabji, Takasir Bhaja, Takasir Sona. Now this is what, you know, that uh, same, everybody has to be measured in the same way. Many of us believe it like that, but this is to miss the real essence of dharma. Dharma doesn't operate like that. Dharma is about the divine unfolding in creation and it does it in a 10,000 ways because different people are in different stages of evolution. That's why Swami Vivekananda says the ideal age of mankind will be when each of us has our own unique dharma, which is actually true. So what applies to one need not apply to Y and what applies to Y need not apply to Z and as many people, as many ways the divine is unfolding. So Savitri wants to tell him that look your job description is not just making everything end badly. That at the end of a cycle I will do pralaya. No, no, no. That's not what your original job is. Originally you are the child of the sun. That's how we see in our, you two are child of the divine. So then in this book we see death um, is chased by Savitri as he carries Satyavan and they go through many different worlds where we travel after death uh, and then there is a dialogue and in that, that dialogue just like in the original story death is finally convinced. But he says knowledge wise you have convinced me. You are a jnani. But jnana is meaningless unless there is shakti. This is something especially meant for India. India got so much into Vedanta, even now we'll hear all this is a wave, wave entering into ocean, this is all illusion or you know you realize but at the end of it when you have a toothache you go to a doctor. Uh, well, that's Vedantic knowledge is wonderful but it's not enough without the Shakti. And Shobhinto reminds this in one of his writings that we have knowledge, plenty, we don't need knowledge. We have also Bhakti. So what is it that we are lacking? We lack Shakti. So without Shakti, you can't change anything. Because she is the divine power whom everybody obeys. So at the end, death says, okay, you have the knowledge. I understand. And they very beautifully described that you have the knowledge that transcends the form and yet it also rejects not form. So that is the ultimate knowledge. That's how Vedanta in Isha Upanishad is that, you know, Vidyancha, Vidyancha, Yasta Dvedo Bhayam Saha. So you have the knowledge, but do you have the power? Now the Divine Mother reveals her power. It's a magnificent image in Book 10, Canto 4, where the, the, the twilight of the earthly real, where she goes in the den of death and shows what that power is. And that power begins to invade death and all sides. That light begins to eat up his thoughts, begins to eat up. Whenever one is afraid of these things, please read that book 10, Canto 4. It's so liberating. Many passages in Savitri, Mother says, randomly you open a page and uh, you will find uh, it has a liberating, transformative effect. If you are depressed, just pull out a page randomly and read. So especially, uh, we have our tradition in India of uh, victory of good over evil or truth over falsehood. But what it really means in the deep essence of things, we will find in Book 10, Canto 4 of Savitri toward the end. Then, after death is slain, now Satyavan is released from death. But that's not enough for him to come back because his body has left the body. So, okay, both of them can be forever together. But how can he go back to the body? It is the law of the earthly life. And if you have to change that law, it cannot be done for one individual. You can't do it. See, that's why in Supreme Court, for instance, when they have a court case, even in human laws, and they pass a judgment, now that becomes a precedence. You can't say only in this case I made a selective case-to-case -case basis. Once you have passed a judgment, it becomes a precedence for all. That's how terrestrial life is a collective life. It's not just an individual. So, that's why we see all the Paanch Chiranjeevis in our literature. You don't find them on earth because they are on subtle physical plane. That has been achieved. But what about this earthly life and its laws? That must change. That death has no power. Death is another manager. He is doing his job, good or bad. 
bad job, well. But there is something still higher that has to grant to earthly life this possibility of uh, divine perfection, of, of which you need a body which can you know, live uh, in a healthy, luminous way as long as it, uh, it needs to. So, then we have book 11, where now she confronts he who was wearing the mask of death. So, death is the mask of what? It's the mask of divine life, immortal life, eternal life of the divine himself. Death, falsehood, uh, all of them are because the, they are the shadows of the divine. That's how uh, Shobindo ex describes it to us. That they have also emerged from the divine but they have revolted. We see that in, even in uh, Bible and other places, the story of revolted angels who have fallen. So now, they even after they are gone, an individual can escape that. But earthly life is still held by them. Death has released Satyavan. He has not released the entire, he has not said, okay, nobody I am going to take away. <laughs> so, that life must change. That is not within the purview of death. So, Savitri goes still further, meets the Supreme and the Divine says, Supreme uh, says that, well, uh, since you are insisting, first he tries to say this is going to create confusion. So please expect a little bit of confusion after the supramental manifestation, which is what we see happening. Why? Because the old laws have gone and the new is yet to fully establish itself. So we are being pushed from all our comfort zones. Why? Because the new and it's a need of truth. And it's becoming so so evident. Maybe one day we'll make this uh, because a lot of people say, where is truth? Where is truth? I was just reading the... Uh, hearing the uh, most latest, I think a few days back, there was this speech of uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, the uh, presidential candidate in the United States. And he starts, uh, he gives 10 commandments and, he's, and he promises, he, he says that I want to base the politics on truth. It's not about being politically correct. And then he says something very interesting. First commandment is, God is real. I was so surprised. I mean, the fact that these things are coming up in the earth atmosphere, it's not about who is winning. But people have begun to speak language whose deep implications they don't know. And we see that all that was buried is coming up. Why? Because the age of truth. So ultimately, but this is going to upset, unsettle many who were holding their positions of falsehood strongly. What will happen to them? They are being kicked out of their um, liars and of their uh, holes and <laughs> citadels of darkness. Uh, agents of death who plan in their creative studio, Shubhinda describes all that. So they are going to revolt, not give in easily. So the Supreme says, will you be able to manage it? It's going to be a chaos for some time and Savitri says, yes. She has come for that. And then he grants her the bone. And that boon she secures for earth and mankind and comes back. Now when she comes back with the boon, we have book 12. And that boon is described in great length. What it is going to be and uh, what really it implies for mankind. Uh, all the future of mankind is shown there in book 11. And this future is not prophecy. Prophecy is where you see in the future. This future is an action of the divine. So he knows but this is not a boon which is granted by some vital gods or mental gods, by some devta. It is a boon by the supreme. So this is going to be, and that described at great length. Those who want to know what is the earth's future, you will find in book 11. Full of hope, full of promise, full of assurance. And it closes with the new race inhabiting this earth, the supramental race, the superman. And then book 12, which is very interesting. Now she has got the boon and she is on earth. So people often say, now where is the supramental world? Now she comes and tells Satyavan, now we have to go to earth and do this work on earth. Boon has been secured, but in time it will manifest. So Satyavan means all of us who are progressively being released from the law of death. Mother and Shurabindu are with us and they are helping us all the time, guiding us, illumining our consciousness. And slowly each one of us has to uh, become part and parcel of this wonderful journey and this wonderful divine manifestation. So in book uh, 12 we see it is like an epilogue. It is an epilogue where the thread is completely, all the loose threads are joined together and the story which starts from the symbol dawn, this was the day when Satyavan must die, closes with its evening, same day, Satyavan is back on earth 
and uh, his father has got back the vision meaning thereby man reclaims his lost divine vision he has got his kingdom meaning thereby that the human soul will regain its lost kingdom of divinity it will not be helpless anymore weak this is the indian way not uh, giving doling out things and pensions to <laughs> senior citizens and no our way is by the power of dharma and tapasya we create that energy we don't want to be dependent on anyone so that's how the kingdom of glory everything is there for a person who has uh, that's how shivendra describes in arya that um, he becomes swarat and then he becomes samrat and then perfected arya becomes arhat he is the perfect one that is the destiny and then savitri and satyavan engage themselves in this great work so who are savitri and satyavan well one way mother and shirbindo and shirbindo says that's not just a symbol they are conscious forces not just forces beings shirbindo is very humble so he doesn't want to say me and mother have been working through the ages so they continue to work and help mankind for this terrestrial transformation which is man's inevitable destiny so this is what we see through the next 25 cantos so first part is 24 cantos and then this second part which comprises book 4 uh, book 5 book 6 book 7 book 8 book 9 book 10 book 11 and book 12 uh, is about 25 cantos and almost uh, same number of pages as uh, book 1 2 3 the reason is because book 2 shobindo expanded we know shobindo wrote and rewrote it because he wanted the perfect perfect perfection which he could transmit through the word the power of the mantra so he was not happy giving one mantra he want because mantra also can be perfected for example we have the traditional gayatri mantra which vishwamitra has given so what was the need of a new mantra new gayatri in the same meter the reason is because shobindo knew that this is incomplete and he describes that even technically it is a bit incomplete but i don't want to go into that so he brings the perfect mantra which is also gayatri in the same meter and at the same time it's more complete more full so similarly we see that shobindo keeps on writing and rewriting 12 times till the perfect vibration rhythm Uh, everything the all the five sons of mystic poetry they are there embodied and enshrined in savitri which is now not just a book but the living word the living experience of shirbinda and the mother and if we read it with a quiet mind with this uh, aspiration inside we come in contact with the mother consciousness of shirbinda and the mother they, that is there in this epic and we begin to change people may say how very simple those of us who have grown up in the tradition of ramayana is rama real for us now for every hindu who has gone through ramayana he'll say of course don't ask such a silly question is krishna real for us we'll say are again you are asking now we what have, what has the rishis done he has made rama so real and alive to us through the magic of his poetry perhaps if a historian wrote he would not be that real because he has shown to us the inner rama the totality of rama which includes everything from you know ajana bhujishar chap dhari sangram jit kar doshnam and then he says mam hriday kunj nivas karu kamadi khal dal ganjanam so rama is at once uh, the magnificent uh, hero of uh, that age at the same time he is the rama who dwells within human heart at the same time he is sarvavyapi at the same time he is parbrahm parmeshwar so this is the beauty of mystic poetry that it creates brings near to us that which is inaccessible to us perhaps even if we saw rama in the physical we would perhaps still may have some doubts because we don't have the eyes to see but if we read the rama through valmiki and i would even say tulsi das ram charit manas which i was quoting then rama become more real to us more near to us this is the magic of sabitri that the divine who is so far so difficult to access he becomes more real and more near to us through this wonderful epic so this is the background and i'll just read a um, couple of passages from here and there um i spoke about the end of death so let me read something about that uh, how this is uh, 
all the details are there in uh, over great length over the talks and so i'm not uh, taking that up but just three four patches passages one of them is page 667 where death dies for satyavan is released by dying death means he retires flees away from satyavan it leaves him free and runs into the inconscient in the presence of the divine mother and we all those with the sanatan tradition know that what we see on diwali and um, vijayadashmi so we have a ravan being burnt and we know effigy and there are patakas and dhum dhadaka now I'll read this see the vast difference and how we need to change our whole approach towards celebrating these event this is inner celebration and when we read it we will understand what is the difference between inner celebration and an outer festivity page 667 or rather last line on page 666 she spoke death unconvinced resisted still although he knew refusing still to know although he saw refusing still to see unshakable he stood claiming his right his spirit bowed his will obeyed the law of its own nature binding even on gods so he is meant to oppose the divine life upon earth he is the one who does not allow anything to manifest in matter he must destroy matter and material based life he cannot destroy life in other domains but he can destroy matter because matter is emerged from in conscience that's where his forte is the two opposed each other face to face who is the other savitri his being like a huge fort of darkness towered around it her light grew an ocean siege a while the shade survived defying heaven a sailing in front oppressing from above a concrete mass of conscious power he bore the tyranny of a divine desire this now the battle between the asura of death and darkness and the divine mother a pressure of intolerable force weighed on his unbowed head and stubborn breast light like a burning tongue licked up his thoughts light was a luminous torture in his heart light coursed a splendid agony through his nerve this is how she is eating away the being of death look at it she not shooting an arrow <laughs> this fire intense fire and in all of us this process licks away the head. this is what we can say literally his head is gone <laughs> his heart is gone the dark stone like heart that is gone light coursed a splendid agony through his nerves his darkness muttered perishing in her blaze her mastering word commanded every limb word is that vibration her mastering word and left no room for his enormous will that seemed pushed out into some helpless space and could no more reenter but left him void so this how and at the end of the page we see two lines afar he fled shunning her dreaded touch and refuge took in the retreating night so what a marvelous description then we spoke about uh, something about book 11 where we see a many passages are so beautiful but we'll just read a little bit about the uh, there is a l- number of pages running through about uh, four pages uh, or even more than that but especially Uh, the last bit i'll read where shivinda describes the divine being i was talking about darshan so people often say oh i couldn't come for darshan of course embodied mother and shivinda is beyond anything but if you want to have darshan read this passage and this passage is about shivinda just as the mother's darshan at the head she stands of birth and toil and fate here is the darshan of the supreme lord 682 the gita says if you have the darshan of the supreme param drashtva everything falls away from you so here is a darshan through the shabd power of the word 
we have read about description of ma durga of ram chandra and shri krishna in our scriptures now read this and i am reading only little bit 682 the bliss that all parts were woven in countless concords here the bliss that made the world in his body lived love and delight were the head of the sweet form in the alluring meshes of their snare recaptured the proud blissful members held all joys outrunners of the panting heart and fugitive from life's outstripped desire whatever vision has escaped the eye whatever happiness comes in dream and trance the nectar spilled by love with trembling hands the joy the cup of nature cannot hold had crowded to the beauty of his face we are waiting in the honey of his laugh few lines below his lips curved eloquent like a rose of dawn his smile that played with the wonder of the mind and stayed in the heart when it had left his mouth glimmered with the radiance of the morning star oh if you lines above about his look the secret whisper of the flower and star revealed its meaning in his fathomless look see this is what those who invaded and destroyed so many uh, murtis of vigra didn't understand that this is the outermost manifestation but the rishis had created the image of these great ones in the heart you cannot touch there you don't have to go to a you know vigra in a temple to worship the temples have come much later anyways when you read shiva tandav stroth image of shiva is there when you read madhur ashtakam krishna is there how are you going to destroy all this so this is how we see now shrivindu has uh, built for us created for us by created i don't mean uh, and it, it's a truth creation created for us the image of the lord and the divine mother at different levels this is the supreme level in our own hearts and minds how he could create it because he saw it and he had the power of the word both you need both that's why shrubindu is yogi and rishi he is yogi because he has become one with the divine bears a supreme identity but he is also a rishi because he can give us the mantra through which he can express what he has seen not all yogis can be rishi not all rishis are yogis but shrubindu is a rishi and a yogi so then this is uh, how uh, we spoke about it dissuades and at the end a little bit about the uh, boon shias which we'll read also 6 it's 696 and 697 this is the offer of shirbindo so what is he offering us is he offering us uh, roti kabda makan clothes shelter food well that is understood that is god don't as to offer these things nature takes care of it your own effort can get you this a happy wife and children well if you develop within yourself peace and harmony all that will come automatically <laughs> if you are not restless anger prone so what is he promising to us what has savitri asked for all of us so page 696 697 i'll just read couple of pass- passages thy peace o lord a boon within to keep amid the roar and ruin of wild time for the magnificent soul of man on earth thy calm o lord that bears thy hands of joy not the peace that comes only during meditation not the peace of the dead man shant ho gaye but the peace even in a battlefield amid the roar and ruin of wild time what a peace this such a treasure a boon within to keep because from the doors of that peace joy can emerge so i'm sure everybody wants it 
But uh, as Shobindu says, everybody would want what the super mind is going to give. But nobody is willing to pay the price. Satyavan had paid the price. And that we will see later on what is the price asked. And then the second boon she gets it for us is Thy oneness, Lord, in many approaching hearts, my sweet infinity of Thy numberless souls. You cannot build unity, harmony on any external platform and basis. It's only when mankind awakens to the oneness of the divine can all discords be settled and there would be spontaneous harmony. You don't have to strive for harmony. It will become the law of being. This is the second bone. And the third one, thy energy, Lord, to seize on woman and man, to take all things and creatures in their grief and gather them into a mother's arms. That Shakti for man and woman. So that all grief is gone, slain. And instead of that, there is light and force and joy. And at the end, thy embrace which rends the living knot of pain. Thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe. Thy magic flowing waters of deep love. Thy sweetness give to me for earth and men the divine peace, divine oneness, divine brightness we may say, divine energy, divine power, divine force, divine love, divine sweetness and as a, as a consequence ultimately divine joy and divine perfection upon earth. So this is what they bring. Sir, what, what is the cost of the ticket? Because for everything there is a price. How many dollars do we give? Dollars you can give anywhere. <laughs> Here he wants yourself. Because only those who give themselves. Any amount of money cannot do it. Money is okay. If we have only money, we are not ready to give ourselves. Give money. Okay. Maybe some touch is, has started. Next time it will be not just money. It will be more work and even that is not enough. Ultimately, it is utter self-giving. That's all that the divine wants. Nothing less and nothing more. So this is what we see in Satyavan. So this is the secret that Satyavan says. Lay, this is page 723. Lay all on her. She is the cause of all. Give everything to her. Surrender, abandon completely. Day and night, repeat, repeat, repeat. Om. Mother Shurabindu is my refuge. Mother Shurabindu is my refuge. Sri Aravindaha Sharanam Mama. Ma Mira Sharanam Mama. Okay, very simple. Ma, 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 ma. Give everything to her. Which implies, and not to anyone else. <laughs> of course, we live in the world where we have duties, where we have associations, we have, we have friendships, everything. But self-giving is only to the divine. So everything else is there. There is love, harmony, beauty, everything should be there between creatures, human beings. And then the secret is further revealed by one of the sages who observes that there is a great change that has come over Savitri because she has brought back Satyavan from the land of the dead and from the, she has grant, got a boon from the Supreme. And then he says, If this is she of whom the world has heard, wonder no more at any happy change. Each easy miracle of felicity of a transmuting heart, the alchemy is. Everything is possible. Once a soul has given itself to the Divine Mother, there is nothing which is impossible. And finally, with these last four lines, we'll stop, comes the secret. So the what is the, like every scripture has the final message. So like in Gita, through the 18 chapters, the final message, what does it come? Man mana bhav mad bhakta madhyaji ma namaskuru. And then says, Sri Krishna says, Sarva dharman paritaja. And he says, this is the most secret of things I am telling you. What is that most secret? Sri Krishna himself tells. 
He says, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Maamikam Sharnam Raja Aham Tva Sarva Pape Bhyo Moksha Ishami Masucha. This is the greatest secret of the Gita. So here also at the end, the master poet, Sri the divine poet, he gives the secret. And again, Savitri speaks about it. So one of the sages asks, what is the secret of this change? Tell me your secret. What tapasya you have done? What meditation technique? Where did you go into the Himalayas? From which guru you took the initiation? What process you followed? What method? In four cryptic lines, Savitri gives her method and the secret. The secret is awakened to the meaning of my heart. That to feel love and oneness is to live and this the magic of our golden change is all the truth I know or seek, O sage. Awaken to the meaning of my heart that to feel love and oneness is to live and this the magic of a golden change is all the truth I know or seek, O sage. This is just a very, very brief outline. Savitri is so, so, so much more and even if all the sages in the world and the seers in the world were to speak about Savitri and write about Savitri, still it will be unfathomable because it's the song of the infinite. This is just an invitation to explore Savitri. The more we dive, the more depth we'll find until one day we discover we have so completely drowned ourselves in it that become we have become one with the ocean. The salt doll went to measure the ocean and it becomes one with the ocean of our love and force that Savitri is. Thank you. Namaste.